Hi, everyone. Thank you all for joining us for the first of three sessions in our three-part teacher program, Teaching for Social Change, Strategies for Media Literacy in 2020. Please note that today's program is being recorded. I want to pause here for a moment. There are a few people that are in our waiting room, so I'm going to wait till everyone joins us before we begin. Okay, it looks like we're gonna go ahead and get started. It seems that most people have been able to join us from the waiting room. Thank you so much for your patience. For those of you who have uh, joined in a little early and I know the teachers are always some of the most punctual people. So I appreciate you joining in early. And I'm seeing some familiar faces in the Zoom boxes. So to our teachers who we've worked with before, hello again. And for the teachers that are new to the Hammer Museum, and to the VAPA program, welcome. So again, my name is Teresa Soto. I'm Associate Director of Academic Programs for the Hammer Museum. And I wanna let you all know that this, that this program is being recorded. This is the first of three sessions in our three-part teacher program, Teaching for Social Change, Strategies for Media Literacy in 2020. Today's program is a collaboration between the Hammer Museum and the Visual and Performing Arts Education Program in the UCLA School of the Arts and Architecture, or VAPA for short. We have been partnering with VAPA on teacher professional development at the crossroads of the arts and social awareness since 2014, but today marks the first time that we have collaborated on an online program, and I'm so excited to welcome all of you to it today. It is my absolute honor to hold virtual space with so many dedicated educators who are taking time during their summer vacation, a well-deserved break after some of the most challenging months in recent history to learn more teaching strategies for your students. In early conversations with my colleagues at VAPA, whom you'll meet shortly, we weren't sure if teachers would be too exhausted to attend teacher programs after such a stressful few months. Yet here we are with, it looks like close to 100 teachers from around the country. Uh, the fact that you're joining us here today is a testament to your dedication to your students and your passion for teaching. And I thank you for it. Your students are incredibly lucky. We are holding virtual space together at a time of unprecedented crises. And of course, I'm not just talking about COVID-19, in addition to a global health crisis, we are more publicly confronted with the crisis of systemic racism, the crisis of severe economic inequality during an economic recession, and the crisis resulting from continuous attacks on free press from those in political power. And yet we still have to teach. Despite all that's going on in the globe, in our cities, and in our own homes, we still have to show up for our students and do our best to uplift them. Our hope for our three-day program is to help you with tools and strategies to address these tumultuous times in your classroom. So I'm gonna go over the agenda for the day. And as I do that, I invite you all to introduce yourselves in the chat. Um, you can say what you teach and where you're tuning in from today. So in terms of the agenda, As the agenda indicates, we will be moving between presentations and interactive discussions throughout our program today. For the presentation portions of the program, your audio will be on mute as it is now. You may wish to select speaker view in the top right corner of your screen during these portions. You will remain on mute until the end of the presentation by UCLA professor and media literacy expert, Jeff Scher, at which point you are welcome to unmute yourself if you have questions. Feel free to toggle your camera on and off using the camera icon 
in the, it might be your bottom left or it might be the top part of your screen. And we do encourage you to keep your camera on if you are comfortable, especially as we move towards the more interactive components of the program, including the session I'll be leading at 345 Pacific Standard Time, which will be an interactive discussion. Following my session, we'll have a short 10 minute break and then artist and educator Felix Quintana will demonstrate how to use Snapseed to create digital images. So if you didn't have a chance to download that app before this workshop, I encourage you to do so. It's a free app that Google has developed. We'll end the program with a final discussion led by my VAPA colleague, Kevin Kane. So I wanna give a shout out to my Hammer colleagues who are working behind the scenes, Dylan and Floor. Do you wanna say hello? They're on there somewhere. They might be waving if you can see them on the Zoom. Hi, everyone. There's Dylan. Hi, everyone. And there's Floor. So they will be working uh, with logistical and technical components, including keeping an eye on the chat. So feel free to ask a question at any time during this program. OK, I want to share a brief intro to the Hammer Museum if you aren't familiar. First of all, I'm curious how many of you have been to the Hammer? If you have, you can select a thumbs up among the reactions options um, at the bottom of your screen. Great. I'm just kind of scrolling through my own Zoom here just to see, and it looks like there's quite a few who have been to the Hammer before. So if you have, um, then you may know what I'm about to share already. And if you haven't, then some of this um, will be new to you. So for those of you who haven't been to the Hammer, this is a picture of the exterior of the building. We're located in Los Angeles, just south of the UCLA campus. The Hammer is one of three public arts organizations at UCLA. The other uh, organizations are the Fowler Museum and the Center for Art and Performance. We have exhibitions and collections that span the classic, classic to contemporary art, and we have more than 50,000 works in our collection, including a vast collection of works on paper. Here are a few exhibitions that we've mounted over the years. Our exhibitions often emphasize contemporary art since the 1960s, especially the work of Los Angeles artists and emerging or under-recognized artists. Like most museums, we are currently closed. However, we have several robust digital archives with essays, artist biographies, and hundreds of digital images of works in our collections and past exhibitions. These digital archives could be really helpful if you're looking for works of art to connect to your curricula, or if you want to uh, give your students a digital resource that they can explore independently. If you miss going to museums for art workshops, uh, as I do, you could check out our Pinterest board, Hammer at Home, Art from the Everyday, where you can find a wealth of activities that are inspired by works of art and Hammer exhibitions and collections. Um, and these are art, ma art making activities that use materials that you can find uh, usually often already in people's homes. We also offer a range of digital programs. Here are the programs we're offering just this week alone. The Hammer's mission is that we believe in the promise of art and ideas to illuminate our lives and build a more just world. And so you can see that mission represented in our programs. We, have a, we cover everything from politics to the arts to meditation. So that is a really quick introduction to the Hammer Museum. Before I go on too long, I do want to turn it over to my collaborator and friend, Kevin Kane. Yes, hello folks, I'm Kevin Kane. I am uh, heading into my fifth year as the director of the UCLA Visual and Performing Arts Education Program. Um, first, I'd like to say greetings from hot and humid Philadelphia, and I'm aware even already just by glancing in the chat that there are some folks from outside the LA area, so we're really kind of thrilled that uh, so many people from lots of different regions and areas have chosen to spend their evening with us or after, afternoon. Um, my task at hand is to uh, briefly um, introduce the UCLA Visual and Performing Arts Ed program, what we call VAPA. Um, and um, 
VAPA is a undergraduate arts education program in the School of the Arts and Architecture. Uh, Teresa has um, generously agreed to move my slides forward. <laughs> so thanks, Teresa. Next one. Um, so the VAPA program encompasses a lot of different things. Um, uh, I think we just skipped over one, um, but I think I remember what's in there. But primarily um, in that first slide, yeah, there we go, is um, uh, uh, arts education courses for uh, undergraduate students. Um, I, generally speaking, the a typical VAPA student would be in the School of the Arts and Architecture majoring in an art form, either dig digital and me media arts, architecture, dance, world arts and cultures, visual arts. Uh, we often have film and theater uh, students. Um, so they're really uh, students really digging in deeply into learning their arts practice and becoming artists. At the same time, they're very drawn to uh, civic and community engagement and they see a way to do that through uh, our arts education courses that leads them into becoming a teaching artist. Um, so with that in mind, our, our courses are very much um, committed to both the theory and practice of arts education um, and utilizing the arts as a tool for engagement and connection, um, which of course in the last six months has meant very different things than it has um, in, previous, uh, in previous years. And yet I'm happy to say that the VAPA program figured out a way to continue to offer all of its courses in the spring, um, continue to uh, place our student teachers into classrooms, albeit virtually, but um, very quickly we did a pivot like I'm sure so many in this room did where uh, you know, our instruction continued and our commitment to local K through 12 classrooms co um, continued. And many of those lessons um, ended up uh, looking really amazing, um, really fabulous work from our undergraduates and um, graduate teaching artists as well, graduate student um, TAs. I think um, a testament to uh, um, having spent a whole year together coming up to that sort of final moment where they were able to, um, you know, stay committed to each other and to the classrooms they had been observing and designing lessons for and um, and uh, hopefully um, you know creating some memorable experiences for the students they were working with but also working closely with classroom teachers um, Teresa we can move forward uh, to the next slide um, this is a little bit of a, if you can see that picture there, is a little bit of um, some of the coursework that we're doing inside the UCLA classrooms where we're actually practicing um, lessons that we're designing and giving feedback to each other. So a lot of our students sort of simulate the classroom experience by pretending to be kindergarten students or fifth graders or 10th graders or 12th graders, whatever the case may be. But also as the year started, um, you know, we were really able to kind of go into those classrooms um, uh, and, um, you know, the ultimate goal for our students is, is very widespread. We're not going to say that all of our students um, end up becoming credentialed classroom teachers, though some certainly do. But um, many sort of um, use our program to figure out uh, a pathway out of the university into um, community and classroom sites where they can um, share what they've um, learned, what they care about. And a lot of that centers around issues of social justice, um, asking the questions of, tough questions of our society about equity and justice, um, equality, and what are the ways that the arts can help um, uh, give meaning to those conversations. Uh, next slide, Teresa. Um, another thing we're able to do, and this has been an extension of the program since I've been the director, is to, um, out after the coursework is over, to allow our um, partners, our school partners, an opportunity to hold after-school art programs that are um, facilitated by our VAPA teaching artists and coordinated by our VAPA staff. Um, I'd like to use this opportunity to plug a few things, um, but first I wanna thank and introduce um, really quickly some of the VAPA staff that are team members that are in the room. Amaret is the program coordinator, Raymundo is the after school arts program coordinator, and Lindsay is the research and evaluation coordinator. They're all here. I don't know if you wanna wave or say hi. I'm not sure what anyone can see. Um, I'm, I'm sure they're waving and saying hi. Um, uh, 
one of the things we've done as of this spring is, is um, sort of combined our lessons in a way that could be accessible not only to the classroom teacher that uh, we were working with to revisit or expand upon, but also maybe to open it up for anyone who finds themselves really um, compelled to bring arts into their curriculum. And so for that reason, I'd, I'd like to invite you to check out our VAPA TV YouTube site and um, uh, you can put your phone up and scan that um, code right there. And I, I've been told that that should take you uh, to the uh, VAPA TV um, and become a subscriber. If not, we'll, we'll be sure to uh, um, remind you how to become a part of the VAPA community um, online and virtually. But in response to COVID-19 and the coronavirus, we've really had to be on the forefront of asking our young teaching artists at the very beginning of their career to imagine what does arts education look like when we have to offer it virtually. And I think you can probably imagine the undergraduates and uh, the young teaching artists in our, in, our, uh, in our program came up with some really, really creative and exciting lessons. Um, Ultimately, they're you know, a generation that is very familiar with technology, so that wasn't the tricky part, I think, but it was definitely a pivot, and I'm really proud of, uh, you know, proud of them and proud of all of us. Um, so uh, the, the, the framing of the next couple of days from the VAPA point of view, the next slide would, would um, be my last slide, Teresa, I think. Um, the way I'd like to sort of frame the next couple of uh, days from the VAPA point of view is through the lens of social emotional learning. And that might be a very familiar concept and um, practice for people in the room. But for those maybe who uh, it's, it's, it's a kind of newish or newer kind of concept, I would like from the arts educator perspective to um, proposition um, propose that the arts space, the arts education, the arts classroom is an ideal area to identify the social and emotional um, possibilities for our students to grow and develop, to connect. Um, the arts, of course, are a space where they can um, express their identity. Our students can make meaning from the arts they're making, but in combination with the, the community that we build and the ways that they can identify the emotions they're feeling, the arts are really a portal to um, our whole selves. And through um, a lot of researchers that came before us, um, in particular this uh, slide from an organization called CASEL, C-A-S-E-L, if you all want to check that out, but it's a uh, um, collective for academic social emotional learning. And they've put out a lot of research about um, the ways that the arts um, can function in a classroom, I, I, you know, and all throughout education, but I, I focus on the arts um, to really help our students um, develop a sense of their social awareness and their self-awareness um, at the same time um, developing um, skills for self-management and responsible decision making and ultimately um, some real uh, um, strategies for making friends and being kind and generous to each other within that space and so maybe that will be something we return to a couple times throughout the uh, throughout the couple of days um, so that's just an intro for arts education point of view. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first guest. We're really super excited that Professor Jeff Scher has agreed to um, attend tonight's session and kind of give us a launching, uh, a launching point and a point of reference. Um, strategies for media literacy is felt very uh, resonant to the time that we're living in. And um, Jeff is a professor in the Graduate School of Education and Information Studies at um, UCLA, and also a faculty advisor um, in the TEP program, which I believe stands for Teacher Education Program, which are graduate students um, um, well on the way to earning um, their uh, um, teaching credential. And um, Jeff's um, specialty is critical media studies, and um, the work is really substantial and very impressive. Um, there's a lot of things that Jeff has been working on the last couple of years, and I know he's, he's excited to share some of them. Um, I think Jeff's latest book is a collaboration, but it's called The Critical Media Literacy Guide, Engaging Media and Transforming Education. And so that's quite a title that I think um, uh, delivers on all that it promises. But for the meantime, I'm really excited and um, happy, Jeff, you were able to join us. And can I turn it over to you, Jeff Share? Wonderful. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. I'm going to dive right in. I'm going to share my screen. Um, and let me start my PowerPoint. Okay. Can everyone see, can you see my PowerPoint? Okay. 
Um, so I want to talk about the need we have today. We're, you know, we're in unique times. These are unprecedented. They're scary. They're um, exciting. There's so much going on that we need to be able to have the tools to be able to make sense of all of the information that we're getting about the time we're living in today. And I think this is where critical media literacy plays a really important role. There's so much we need to be asking and thinking about. And if we think about just in terms of the pandemic and what's happening, back in March, the Secretary General of the United Nations said, our common enemy is COVID-19, but our enemy is also an infodemic of misinformation. And this idea that our information is also being um, uh, hampered with, uh, it's being interfered with, it's being manipulated, and it's, it's very hard these days to know what do we believe, what don't we, and what do we ask and challenge, and how do we deal with um, the amount of information we have that's just astronom astronomical. So one approach is just simply fact checking. You know, when we get information, going and finding resources online that are available to help us just fact check and know if the information is accurate or not. This is not an end all so solve all. Um, and this is actually just one strategy in, in a mixture of many that I just wanted to throw out as just one resource. But what we need to do and what media literacy tries to do is go much deeper beyond just simply fact checking. Because what we have to recognize is that today there's so much false information available. There's misinformation, people just making mistakes. There's disinformation and propaganda, people on purpose trying to uh, trick us. There's outrageous conspiracy theories, um, especially now related to the, the virus that actually Snopes has said that they're not even able to um, evaluate all of them on a daily basis because there's so many. There's hoaxes, there's pranks, there's satire, there's parody, and there's advertising and public relations. I mean, it, some of it's new, but a lot of it isn't. And the challenge to be able to make sense of the world around us is huge. And I think this is a, a fabulous place for educators to engage our students, whether we're using art or whether we're using any different forms of communication. So I wanna start with a way that oftentimes when we teach literacy, we start with an alphabet. So this is um, an alphabet that's made up with the first letter of different products and brands. And what I'm gonna ask, it's a little game I wanna play with you. If you wanna play the game, please unmute your, um, your microphone so that you can join in. And I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna call out one letter at a time. And as I call out the letter, please just shout out what you think the, either the product or the brand is, okay? So go ahead and unmute. And let's start this. A. Amazon. Amazon. Very good. All right. B. Barbie. B. Robbins. Good. C. CNN. 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 Very good. D. Disney. Auschwitz. E. Entertainment. E. Entertainment. Entertainment. Okay. F. Facebook, Facebook. Zuckerberg's Nightmare. G. Google. Oh. H. Honda. Hi. IBM. Yeah. Yeah. Johnson, Johnson & Johnson. Johnson. Hey. Kellogg. Kellogg. Lego. 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 M. McDonald's. Oh. Obama. 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 Interest. 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 Interest.
of advertising and marketing and branding that we have all around us all the time. And some people talk about this as a public pedagogy. There's things we're learning all the time that we don't go to school to learn, that we don't even realize we're learning. But there's so much of this around us and the way the uh, information comes to us, most of the times it's, it's in a way we don't think, we don't ask and we don't critically challenge um, this learning. So out of all of the letters in the alphabet, there's one here that's really different than all the others. So if we think about all of these as selling a product or a brand or a service, there's one that we don't often think about in that way. And that one I want to argue is the O, right? Obama. Obama was, is a person. He was a political candidate. It's about a political party. It's about democracy. And yet it's one of the brands. In fact, it's not just one of the brands. When Obama won the first time in 2008, his logo and his advertising brand won the top award in, in France, the Cannes Lions International Advertising Festival, won the number one award for being the best advertising. So when we think about advertising, it's not just simply a problem of consumption, it's also a problem of democracy. And this brings us into the realm of, of really rethinking our information system in terms of what's going on, what are we selling and buying, what are the messages that are being repeated over and over that they start to become feeling like they're normal or natural. Um, so when we talk about media literacy, I'm going to use two uh, definitions to kind of unpack critical media literacy. And I think what, we're trying, what I'm trying to get at is a new understanding of literacy. When we think about reading and writing the word in the world, one thing we need to do is expand our understanding of what it is we're reading and writing. And so the notion of reading and writing needs to include images, sounds, advertising, social media, popular culture, as well as print. All of these are different art forms as well, right? And so when we're talking about what it means to be literate in the world today, it's got to go beyond just letters on a page. The second part is the harder part, and I think this is the essential part, especially for social justice educators, is that we need to deepen the ability to critically analyze the relationships between knowledge and power in society. Because information and power is always connected. Even if we don't see it and don't realize it, doesn't mean it's not happening there's always these connections of power. And so this is the beginning of our framework. Critical media literacy tries to, it involves the struggle to challenge the dominant ideologies and the systems that make them appear natural and normal. And I'm using quotes around normal and really around natural too, because I don't think there really is anything that's normal or natural. These are all constructions that we create. But what we wanna do is we wanna, analyze and question how these constructions impact and influence us in society. And not simply by looking at a single representation, but looking bigger at the systems, because it's the systems within which everything operates that provides the context for how we think and interact in the world. A framework that we use for teaching critical media literacy um, is this with the six questions and, and concepts. And what I want you to think about is how this framework actually could inform your own teaching with whatever it is that you're teaching. Because I think these are key aspects of basic literacy that we do all the time um, in, in every area. You know, the Common Core talks about literacy instruction should be happening everywhere from science to PE to language arts to art in all areas because it's all about communication. So this framework, um, there's a link that you'll get to a PDF of it, so you can download this later. The core concepts on the left are the ideas that I, I help teachers think about and, and integrate into their lesson planning and their teaching as goals that they want their students to be able to reach and understand. The questions on the right side are actually the tools that we use with our students. And maybe the questions need to be tweaked or modified for your own students, and that's absolutely perfect because everything needs to be you know adjusted so that we are meeting our students where they're at and taking them um, to to deeper ideas so using these questions as a framework and then as a, a tool to help them understand the bigger ideas like question number one who are all the possible people that made choices to create this well that's trying to get at the idea that everything's been created that the, that things just don't happen 
just because that's how it's always been or that's how it'll always be. And this is a really important part about remaking and challenging the world is understanding that it's been created by people and people every day are reinforcing this. And so people every day could be taking it apart and making a better world as well. So I'm gonna jump into um, this idea of all information is constructed by individuals and groups of people who make choices in, within social context. So here's a little trick question for you, right? You're watching a TV program about bears. What do you see most? But since we don't have that much room for really interactivity, I'm just gonna kind of jump in and say, a lot of people say, well, we see bears, right? And yeah, we do. But what we forget is that idea that it's, we're never seeing bears. We're always seeing pictures of bears, right? We're seeing the media. And so often the media, because it's so normalized, it's around us all the time, we forget that. And when we talk about what we just saw, we'll talk about the bears eating in the water, but we forget about the other questions about, well, who took those pictures of the bears? How did they take the pictures? What are they not showing us? What about the music? How is that positioning me to feel a certain way about the bears? Does it matter if the bears, the pictures we're seeing were created by the NRA or by the Sierra Club? All of that is part of helping us understand the message. And we need to be talking about not just the content, but also the medium and re realizing the way the medium and the content work together to influence each other. So the questions are essential. The questions we ask determine our process of inquiry. And that's why with our critical media literacy framework, we emphasize so much the importance of those questions because what we're trying to do is not teach kids, oh, this is right, that's wrong. We're trying to teach them how to be inquirers, how to ask and question, how to think critically on their own. We're trying to develop those skills. And so the questions, the more critical they are, the more likely they're gonna go down a path that's gonna help them see structures and systems. So question number one, we could ask, who are all the possible people who made choices that helped create this text? As a way of just starting to recognize that there are people involved that are making these decisions. Question number two gets more specific. And this is something we see oftentimes in the arts where we're teaching specific um, artistic mediums, right? And it's important to understand that each medium has its own language with specific grammar and semantics. And typically in schools, we teach just print literacy. That's where we kind of landed and, and never really moved beyond yet. And I think we will be moving much more beyond that eventually, but we can be doing that now and understanding that. So the way we learn in school about nouns, verbs, adjectives, we can also be learning about visual language, sound language, motion, all these different elements that each one has their own, their own grammar that it, it positions and shapes the ways we make sense of the message that we get. So if we think about visual language, you know, what's some of the grammar? Well, there's colors, there's lines, there's light and dark, there's graphs, there's symbols. There are all these different elements that we wanna be teaching. And I wanna argue that this is what we should be teaching, not just in art classes. This is what we should be teaching in all our classes, in language arts and science and math, because these different languages we use every day. And in the real world, we're not separated into these silos of academic content, right? Another language we think about is oral language, sound, sound effects, the way dialogue and narration works, the way special effects and sounds, the way music, whether it's setting an, am an atmosphere or it's creating a whole visual um, landscape, but the role that language plays in itself and sounds is very important. And then moving on, images and sounds together, we have a whole other language, the landscape of multimodal language. The visuals affect us differently from their sound as they would if there were no visuals, just sound. So the combination of interaction both together it's yet a whole other language that we use and we need to be thinking critically about how it is positioning us. So we're gonna jump in to that and we think about all the different languages and codes and conventions of social media. Just about every different social media platform has its own rules and um, requirements. 
So it's not the same thing to communicate with Instagram as it is with Twitter, right? Everything has its benefits and its limitations. And these different codes are part of the way we communicate um, with more and more different technologies and forms of media. So asking the question is, how was this text constructed and delivered and accessed is one of the important questions we need to get at to be able to understand and take apart these different codes and the way language works and then also the way it connotes other understandings. So that's kind of in a quick nutshell how we use this framework. And I think the framework is just one tool. We need many tools. There's so many issues, but I think this is an exciting way we can start kind of jumping in and understanding um, the information around us and, and engaging our kids, our students, through, through a process that's empowering them, empowering them to be the ones thinking, questioning, wondering, challenging, and creating. So one of the big things I want to mention as I'm kind of wrapping up is the idea that what critical media literacy does is it helps us analyze the messages, but it also helps us think about how we create. Because just like we read, we also write, right? We listen, we speak, we view, we represent, we analyze, we produce. So our students should also be creating, creating art. Art is a fabulous way. Um, and media has so many different art forms that we can be using. I wanna share with you just one um, quote and then an example. So from Rethinking Schools, the editors write, if we ask the children to critique the world, but then fail to encourage them to act, our classrooms can degenerate into factories of cynicism. While it's not a teacher's role to direct students to particular organizations, it is a teacher's role to suggest that ideas need to be acted upon and to offer students opportunities to do just that. And I think that's where art and media production come, come into play to really be a, a powerful place to empower students to do real, real work that really matters and can contribute to improving society, to challenging social injustice and environmental injustice. So I wanna share with you this one short clip, a claymation done by a 16 year old student. that I think it's a, a fabulous example of how powerful art can be and how students can really be contributing such strong messages to our society. I want to just wrap up this last slide um, with a link that you could use to find lots of resources that we've been posting online at UCLA and we have material here with videos, uh, podcasts, articles, lesson plans, um, that I've been collecting and I continue to uh, add to this website as a resource to look critically at all information and technology. So I hope this is something that can be useful. Um, and I'm gonna stop for a Q&A. Thank you so much, Jeff. This is Kevin again. Um, so a little context um, about the room and then we'll, we'll um, I'll try to pull out a few questions that emerged from your presentation. Um, we're obviously a very uh, diverse group of folks in here, um, but primarily uh, educators um, 
um, educators interested in using the arts in our classrooms. Um, and the range is from grade four to grade 12. So I can imagine a lot of what you offered might look or sound different depending on the, the grade that a, a, someone is teaching. And I wondered if maybe one question that emerged is, do you have just sort of a general sense of um, to, you know, at what point in a child's development are, are certain concepts or uh, strategies more effective than others or maybe more responsible than others? Sure. So we, we want to be developmentally appropriate. Um, but I think too often times teachers and parents as well underestimate the developmental abilities of our youth. And I, I've been doing this work with very young children. I mean, we started with my son when he was just barely talking. I think kids have a very deep understanding of right and wrong. I mean, you take away a candy from a child, they know that's wrong. Um, so I, I think it's how we frame it and how we guide them in this understanding of questioning social justice and, um, and the ways we provide them tools that they can start to express their own voice and their own thoughts and ideas. I mean, it starts as simply as just drawing and coloring, but it can go so much further, so much quicker these days, because uh, we have so many more new tools. Yeah. Um, so a, a, a bunch of questions are coming in, so bear with me as I try to sort through them. But I thought this one was interesting. Um, you know, last, March, I think it's something like March 11th specifically, most of us in the classroom got the word that we would no longer be teaching um, in person, but we would have to switch to remote. Um, and I think most of us, uh, you, know, you know, we reacted to that news and we did the very best we could. But I think somehow this time is about um, not only reacting to that um, reality, which can, will continue for at least, I guess, six more months um, for, for most of us. Um, if not more, but now it's maybe a time to respond to it a little bit more thoughtfully and a little bit more intentionally. Um, I, I don't wanna speak for all teachers, so I'll speak for myself, but I'm really hoping that the summer gives me some epiphanies about what worked well in that time frame and what could work better and what I could maybe slow down a little bit. Um, and I wonder if you've been thinking about some of those same things with your students at UCLA. Well, so we, we're doing everything online now and last quarter as well. Um, what I try to do is include more of the media, using more of it, just because that's, that's the world we're in right now and using it in a critical way because too often, you know, we end up being kind of co-opted by technology and told this is what has to happen. But I think we can take, take that control back and we can be using it, having students instead of writing essays, you know, taking pictures, having students creating videos, creating cartoons, um, doing so much more and especially with art the more we can be including that as the ways that we're um doing all of our pedagogy our teaching our learning through different forms of assessments through different forms of application um it just seems so much more holistic holistic and um it will tap into those socio-emotional needs and it can also be part of giving a, creating and building civic engagement because this is how politics and how the world is being run these days is through the technologies through these platforms so the more we can kind of help kids question and think about them as well as participate and use these tools whether they're creating memes or they're um you know creating um podcasts videos there's so much they can be doing now and it's so much easier than it. it's never been this easy. You know, with cell phones, you don't have to go buy film. You don't have to, you know, do all the things we used to have to do because we have these, these tools that can be used in very powerful, critical ways. Uh, just a shout out to one of the participants. Um, I saw Darlene wrote that she's already been exploring and incorporating meme literacy. Mm -hmm. So, I, Darlene, I don't know who you are, but I, I think you should brand that because I never heard of that before, but I like it. <laughs> um, but speaking of, uh, you, one of your slides, um, I think suggested that um, the world is not only constructed or co-constructed, I think is the, the word you use, but also mediated. And, um, you know, is there one question that uh, I'm reading here is about the responsibility of teachers to 
teach our students to be responsible mediators. Um, and in particular to the way that they're using social media, they are actually mediating a story, they're mediating an identity, they're mediating a kind of concept or a world that they live in. And um, you know, do you have any suggestions on how we as educators can be a part of their choices they're making? Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, part of it, I think, is just helping them understand just how powerful this is, that our language, our words, everything we do matter. Um, and we're seeing that, unfortunately, in the negative sense with cancel culture, but we're also seeing that being exposed more and more in terms of how these ideologies have existed for so long and not been challenged and questioned. You know, white supremacy, patriarchy, homophobia, transphobia, all of these things have always existed and they've been reinforced, communicated, institutionalized through language, through words, through art, through imagery. And all of these things matter the way information is represented. So I think the more students can start to understand the power of this, they can start to see the power that they can have and the responsibility they have when they're um, producing, resharing, tweeting, whatever it is, but when they're creating, Creation is, is an extremely powerful opportunity to express and to contribute to the world. Um, Jeff, you know, a few people, um, we probably won't get to all these questions, but a few teachers definitely are interested in the power and the, uh, I don't know, ubiquity of social media in, this, in, in our lives as well as our students' lives. Uh, but I think maybe for a final question, there was a couple folks interested in that claymation project that you just showed. Um, it's very powerful. There's a few questions about when and how you might teach that, what subject that might be appropriate for. But maybe the question I want to focus on, because I feel like it, it, it stirs something um, in, in some folks, is um, it's powerful, but it really requires conversation um, in the classroom about using art um, you know, as an example of a very strong message that has the power to trigger or re-trigger trauma or um, uh, certainly social consciousness, but also maybe, you know, um, some very complicated feelings as well. Um, do you want to speak to that? Sure. So I, I think one of the key ideas is to understand that art, like language, is never neutral. And like Ibram Kendi talks about, you know, you can never be not racist. You're either racist own um, privileges, our own assumptions, our own biases, that none of us are neutral, no matter what we think, no matter what we're told. And so our choice then is how do we help guide our students to look inward and find what, are, what do they bring to the table that's valuable, that, sh that they can contribute to the world and as we start doing that and they start experiencing and sharing their own passions, their own assets and, and the wonderful, valuable things that they bring, we can also then start looking at how society is framing and, and the stories that society is telling. And when we see that the stories that we're being told in society are hurting people, then we need to step up and say, that's not okay. How can we do better? What does it mean to, to be anti-racist. It's not about just not being racist. It's about taking a stand and saying, this is not okay. White supremacy should not, is not right. And I think that's the role of the artist is to take a stand and help people. And a, and a wonderful thing about teachers is that we have this great opportunity where we can be the guides, the mentors with young, excited, fresh minds to say, how can I help you? How can I guide you so that we can all start to see the value you have and the ways we can all work together to make society better? Thanks, Jeff. Um, like I said, there's, there's a chunk more questions for you. And maybe if we can combine them, it might be interesting for you to read them afterwards. But um, Teresa, were there any other questions that you saw that emerged or um, didn't have a chance well, to? Um, I, it does seem like Ruthless Green has their hand raised. Did you want to weigh in with a quick question or comment? Well, I, I can't believe my Facebook name is on here. Um, I um, was reacting to what you said and you know everything that's going on with COVID. I just think that the way the uprisings have been portrayed, you know, if you look at different news networks, 
uh, you know, the Black Lives Matter protests. I think that's one of the biggest things with media literacy is looking at with the election coming up. Um, the kids are going to need to um, be literate in, in all of this. Absolutely. No, it, we have so many crises. I mean, it, it really isn't about dealing with just one. You know, if in anything, the pandemic has kind of exposed the multiple crises that were already in existence before crisis, it's huge. After the pandemic, after we get a vaccine, we're still gonna have this issue with uh, warming environment and the, the global issues that are not affecting people equally. And so the deeper problems of racism, of sexism and all these issues are also just gonna compound it and make it worse for some people than others and hold some people less responsible than others. So I think questioning all of this is such an important, important role that teachers need to play. Thank you so much, Jeff, for that incredibly informative presentation. I'm going to switch gears um, into thinking a bit more about the, the questions you pose for students to think about in terms of media literacy by talking together about a work of art. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, if you will bear with me as I do that. Okay, so it's just on a blank screen for now. Um, I just wanted to mention, for, I will be asking everyone to participate if you are feel comfortable with your video on. Um, we will be asking you to unmute yourself if I call on you. For this part of the workshop today, it is, it is a very interactive part, and so I do want to hear from as many people as we can fit into this session. Um, I mentioned that I'm going to use some of the really useful questions that Jeff shared with us from his critical media literacy framework, and I'm going to tweak them a little bit just to be in keeping with how we discuss artworks at the Hammer, and you'll see that um, throughout. And if, for those of you who might be taking notes, I just want to let you know that I will be sharing the questions in the ways that I, I tweak them slightly at the end of the, of the discussion, so there's no need to jot down any notes at this time. So I do want to add a couple of things before we begin. One is that it's worth noting that I want to often start with art uh, before even talking about media sometimes because, and when I say media, I mean popular media, because I believe that a dis discussion about art is a good way to begin a conversation about what might be a particularly challenging topic. Um, often when there's a chart, uh, there's a potential for a charged conversation. Um, I do feel like art is helpful in that way because you can always lean on the fact that an artist's perspective is just that. It's an individual's perspective. And you could pick a work of art whose theme relates to current events but was made in the past. And that temporal distance could be really helpful to provide emotional distance for both you and your students. And that could really be um, incredibly helpful if the moment that you want to relate to is, um, is particularly challenging from a, a triggering standpoint or, or re-traumatizing standpoint. So starting with art um, is often helpful for that reason. That said, um, I, I agree with Jeff that you don't need to wait for like the art unit or the media literacy unit to really hone in on those critical thinking skills. Of course, I'm biased, but I do think that there's always opportunities to include discussions about arcs, about artworks throughout your curricula. And one way that I think has been really helpful for teachers is to use it as a unit opener to think about a work of art that has a parallel theme and to um, use it as a way to start building critical thinking skills from the very, very beginning of the academic year. So I will show you an image in a moment, a few housekeeping notes. Um, again, please raise your hand if you want to participate and either click on the virtual raised hand or if you do have your video on, you can just raise your actual hand. Um, you're also welcome to respond to prompts in the chat. I'll just be completely transparent that I have not led a discussion about art with over 100 people at once. Um, so I will do the best that I can to try and honor as many responses as possible during this time. And if I don't get to everybody's comments and questions, then I apologize in advance. 
I also want to introduce my colleague Tara Burns, specialist for family and K-12 audiences, who has been joining us throughout this whole time, helping um, very diligently behind the scenes on a variety of logistical components. And she is going to help me to call on people during this time. So Tara, do you want to say hello? A quick hello to friends who I already know and friends who I hope to get to know over the course of these three programs. Uh, like Teresa said, during the portion where she'll ask for responses, I'm going to go ahead and click through and sort of feed names her way. I'll click as fast as I can and I hope that I get to everyone. Um, but if I don't, feel free to just chat me. Looking forward to the conversation. Okay. Thank you, Tara. Um, there's so many people working behind the scenes to make this run smoothly, and I just want to give a shout out to everybody. Thank you so much. It's been such an incredible learning experience. So let's begin. I'm going to give you a few minutes to look at this work closely, quietly, and then I'm going to ask you for um, comments on what is is it that you notice? What draws your attention? But for now, we're just going to look at it quietly. Okay, what do you notice? What draws your attention? We have a couple of comments in the chat, Teresa, that are noting that the image is in black and white. Great, yeah, so we're already starting to pick up on how the image was made or created, and we're noticing the colors in this, that it's black and white. Thank you. And I have a raised hand from Tracy. Hi, Tracy. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Tell us what you see. Hi, Tara. Um, I'm noticing the person in the second row who seems to be glaring at the person in the front row that stood out for me. Mm. Okay, that's great. I'm gonna see if I can find my pointer here. Um, seeing this person in the back that seems to be glaring at the people in the foreground. That's a really good observation, Tracy. Nice to see you in the Zoom. Okay, other responses, other things you notice. It looks like two participants have raised their hands. Oh, Jade, go ahead and unmute yourself and give us your comment. And after Jade, uh, we'll go to Robin. Um, just one thing I'm noticing off the bat is sort of the similarity in relationship to an image like this to some of the images we've seen just recently with the BLM protests. Yeah, so you're noticing some similarities. Could you talk a little bit more about those similarities between um, this and then some recent imagery? I don't know. I think that like I've even seen recently where some of these the current images they all put in black and white. Um, and I think it kind of is making people realize how dated this conversation about racial injustice is. So some of the similarities I see are um, these sort of uh, angry, or maybe not angry faces, but the expression on their faces, like they're chanting or saying something. Um, they've got, you know, these uh, self-made, um, uh, what do you call these, like uh, posters. Um, and then also these like seem to be people of color as well. Okay, great. So um, tr thinking about how this might uh, connect to or relate to our present moment um, and the ways in which there's a lot of passion that's being exuded from the individuals that are protesting, the signs that they're making, um, the reminder that in inequities and protests about inequities have been happening for a very long time. Okay, great. Thank you for that, Jade. And Robin, I think was next. Mm -hmm. And after Robin, I saw Deidre's hand and then George's hand. Okay. 
And then after that, we'll move to our next line of questions. Go ahead, Robin. Um, thank you. I um, definitely echo a lot of the previous comments and um, ideas that have come up already that um, maybe this is like a LGBTQ plus um, demonstration of some sort. The posters seem to indicate um, maybe they're showing up for support, maybe a friend or maybe a, a public figure. It seems to be saying like Olga Briskin, uh, cambiada de sexo. So I think that means like Olga Briskin will change their sex. Um, so I'm wondering um, if uh, they're like showing support in some ways. Um, I'm also wondering where this could be taking place because my first thought was immediately um, Los Angeles, but actually I'm not sure. Great, thank you for pointing that out. So um, you mentioned the text on the sign here and I wanted to, it's a little hard to read on the screen because above that uh, Olga Briskin, who was an, uh, an actor in, in Mexico, um, there's also some additional text above it that um, refers to a secretary of Olga Briskin, um, who uh, there was a lot of sensationalizing about this individual and speculation about a sex change. So I wanted to draw your attention to that there. Great. And then Deirdre and then Georgia. Their arms are linked in the front line. Okay. So we're seeing their arms linked here. And the two on the right, similar to me. You know, I, I, I'd like to imagine that the person on the right isn't there in support of the person in the middle. So when you say right, Deidre, are you referring to this individual here? Yes, yeah, stage left, uh-huh. Okay, and these two, there's a lot of similarity in, um, in, in appearance, is that what you were saying? Yes. And uh, body language, too. Body language, okay. So mirroring um, some of the pose and also the way that the photographer has captured the full body in both of, with both of these individuals. And then I'm a, I'm a mom, so I see that, I don't think it's for weather. I think that the umbrella is for protection. Hmm, okay, so wondering whether or not this umbrella is there for weather protection, okay. So um, I'm wondering about also Robin's question about where this might be. And um, we don't see umbrellas too often in Los Angeles. So that's interesting. Okay, and Georgia? Thank you. Um, I noticed the right away the gender fluidity of the subjects and kind of to echo Jade, the, um, how it reminded me of current images. Um, especially the photo at the poster in the bottom, they look like pretty personal images or photos. And I see that a lot now with um, families of victims of police murder and brutality um, at protests. So that's what that reminded me of. Yeah, okay. So seeing a lot of these personal images at the bottom here of people together, possibly family, possibly loved ones, um, and recalling how that might um, or connecting how that might relate to our current moment as well and seeing how many images um, have appeared on signs and a lot of the uprisings and protests that we've seen lately. Okay, thank you so much everyone for your initial um, observations. I'm wondering if we could talk a little bit about the points of view that are represented in this image. Whose points of view are represented? Pulling from Jeff shares incredible list of questions and making it um, really thinking about it in relation to this. Okay, so it looks like two participants have raised their hand. Tara, I can't see that unfortunately. I think that Darlene, I can't tell if this was a holdover from the last one or if you just raised your hand, but if you wanna answer this recent question, go ahead and unmute yourself. Thank you. No, I just wanted to add um, in terms of the context um, and the top left, there's like these um, uh, kind of like spires, obelisks, and that's actually from a monument in Mexico City. Um, 
and behind that we see like the Castillo de Chapultepec. So I'm pretty sure this is happening in Mexico City in that area of the of the museum. There's like a really big plaza and it's a pretty particular spot for people to protest. That's what I wanted to add. Such great observation yeah. skills. Thank you so much. And so now we have a location. Um, just using our observational skills to unpack this a bit more without giving very much information. So thank you so much for that additional detail. We have two more raised hands. The first that I saw was from Nat. So Nat, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. And after Nat, we'll have James. You may have lost Nat. All right, I'll say James, James, go for it. And then Nat can come in um, after. So the point of view that I see this is from the photographer's point of view. And someone had mentioned earlier that that gentleman in the second row is glaring towards the front row. I don't feel that he's glaring at the front row. I feel he's glaring at the photographer, which then lends to whose voice is this picture trying to present? Is it those that are standing there with the, the signs and chanting or singing, whatever they happen to be doing? Or is it someone from the media? Is it someone who is trying to spin this a specific way because they've captured just this one moment and that is all we are seeing? Okay, great, thank you so much. So. Um, adding a possibility here that this person in the background may not actually be glaring at the people in the foreground, but may be glaring at the photographer um, who, uh, you know, obviously we don't see. So one potential point of view that we're seeing here is the photographer's point of view. Excellent. Other thoughts? I'll share, Teresa, some of what I'm seeing in the chat and two, two, um, Comments that I'm seeing a bit are the newspaper, assuming that this was printed by a newspaper, um, and also the possibility that we're seeing other protesters. So people who are in an opposite position from the folks featured here, but literally physically opposite from them, not necessarily opposite from uh, whatever it is that they are doing photographed here. Mm -hmm. So the protesters that are in the background as well is, are visible, is that what you're is that what you're saying, Tara? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah, so um, we are only seeing just these two figures um, in this image when in fact we can imagine based on the way that this is cropped, at least a couple of people on this side and likely a lot of people around um, this group as well just by the framing of this. So that is a really good question. Um, Let's think about that. If the artist had made different choices, how would the impact or meaning of the image change? So we're thinking about this image from this vantage point where we see two figures, a focus on these two figures and the signs that they're holding. And it is um, you know, a full length depiction of these two image, two figures here. Now, what if the photographer chose to zoom in, chose to zoom out? Uh, chose a different angle, how might that impact the message or the meaning of this image? I'm seeing a desire in the chat for more photos in order to be able to tell. Mm -hmm. um, and um, one comment from Molly that says, it could draw more attention to the person in the second row if it zoomed in. So giving us perspective from someone else. I like that. So if we were just to zoom in here, it would be a completely different image with the figure in the background who really feels like a, like a background figure um, will take a more, more of a main character position. I'm seeing a raised hand from Susanna. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Let us know what you think. Well, if the photograph was taken, if there are a lot of people there and you've got more of an aerial view, it would um, persuade the viewer that this was something felt by a lot more people. We've got no idea how many people felt the same way as the, 
as these people that they're currently focused on. So by cropping it, you're not getting the power of the mass. Yeah, that's great. So we see the protesters here, uh, just, just two with their entire bodies. Um, and we see what they are, are sharing with us and we know what they are, what point of view they have. Now, we don't see whether or not the other protesters that are here might be talking about similar subjects, but might have different signs. Um, we, might, we don't see whether or not there are counter protesters. We don't see whether or not there are um, security or police in this space, right? So it really is focused on um, these uh, specific figures. So I'm wondering who are all the possible people that may have made choices that impacted this image? Who are all the possible people that may have made choices that impacted this image? Looks like James has his hand raised. I just wanted to comment though previously because we keep calling them protesters. We, we are making that assumption they may be, be there in support to celebrate someone. They may be there to support someone who may have passed on. It, it may be an ugly crowd. It may not be an ugly crowd. And again, the, the way that this photo has been taken leaves too much interpretation to the viewer because there isn't enough information. The photographer has chosen this to crop to. James, so, that's a really excellent point. And it's so um, interesting to look at this image in this moment when we can't help but bring our own kind of lived experience to this and to make connections and parallels between the images that we've seen recently um, and connected to this work. But it's true. How do we know exactly um, what, they're, what they're communicating? I think Jade had, had a hand up. Maybe. Uh, All right, yeah. um, I think so. The question was um, like, who could have a part in this? You're saying? Yeah. Who are all the possible people that may have made choices that impacted this image? Yeah. So one thing I all echo that I see a lot in the chat is that it's possible that there was an editor, um, whether photographically, whether it was through you know publishing a newspaper or whatever, even today, maybe even on Twitter. Um, and that could very much change the way we see this image because it could be the case where the photographer, you know, did have a photograph of a ton of people and then the editor decided to crop it to just these two. Um, so we can't just think of sort of the photographer at, at fault of what's happening here. Um, there might be a whole team behind them. Great. Yeah, that's great. It's, it's, it's such a useful question to ask that. Who are all the possible people that may have made choices? We don't often think about the editor. Um, maybe there's another person. Maybe the people in this image also wanted to be photographed. Um, it's hard to know. So asking all of those important questions are, are really key to, to thinking about um, how to interpret this. I want to move to another question. What would you title this image? I'd love for you to just pop in a title in the chat. I wish that I could see it. The chat that is, but I can't. Maybe Tara, you could read some titles out loud. The first title that's come in is from Deidre who titled it Mother and Son. Okay. Ellen Kaplan's title is Peaceful. Layla's title is family. Another title, peaceful protest, taking a stand. For all of us. Free speech, united, we are here. The personal is political. Our voices. Someone put in untitled, comma 1972, which I love. <laughs> El Pueblo Unido is one. Subjective righteousness. Embroidered peace and duality. 
Is everyone an English teacher? <laughs> These are so great, Tara. I'm going to stop you there. I know we're getting at the end of our session here. Um, those were really, really great titles. Thank you so much for sharing that and, and joining in that exercise. I'd love for you to, now that you're seeing the artist's name, Yolanda Andrade, and the title of this work, Las Protestantes, or the demonstrators, we have a little bit information about this work now. It was made in 1984. Um, and I wanted to just pose to you, if you think about the title that you put into the chat, how might your identity, your values, your lived experiences, recent news, how might they have influenced your choice for a title? Just think about that for a second. We're not gonna talk about that too much, but just think about how your own title might have been shaped by your own subjectivity and positionality. Just a moment of reflection. It really goes back to what James was saying about um, not even knowing for sure at the time before we saw the title here um, that these were protesters, right? And so reading onto it um, based on our lived experiences is something that we always have to check, you know, check ourselves and check our biases, our subjectivity when we look at something. So I want to share that um, this photograph was. Um, was taken, you know, obviously in the 1980s. And this is a time in Mexico when the gay rights movement was really um, burgeoning. And the artist, Yolanda Andrade, had been doing a lot of photographs on the streets of Mexico City. And this represents sort of an early years of community organizing in the LGBTQ plus community there. Although they wouldn't have called it with those specific um, without specific acronyms at the time, right? So um, that gives you a little bit more background just briefly on this image. There's a, a little bit more information about this work on our Radical Women digital archives. And I wanna move to that because one of the other really powerful questions that Jeff Scher asked us is to look at where the image was. Where did we see the image? Um, what do you know or notice about the publication or site where you saw the image? Um, why do you think the publication or site chose to share this image? So thinking about this image now within the context of an exhibition called Radical Women, Latin American Art from 1960 to 1985, that was mounted by the Hammer Museum, which is an art museum that has social justice in its mission now gives you a greater kind of understanding of the context of this work. Um, and that kind of thinking is really helpful um, to translate into thinking about media. So I just wanna end here. Here are all the questions that I asked. It's a lot of text at one time. Um, and again, we're going to share a recording of this session so you can have that. Again, it's, it's pulling very, um, liberally from Jeff Shares questions, but specifically asking some things based on thinking about artwork in particular. Um, we won't have time to unpack this, but I wanted to share this image because it was recently used by Fox News and it was on their homepage. And if we had taken the time to unpack this image, gone through all of the questions that we did, how was this image made? What choice did the artist make to create this image? Um, how would the impact of the meaning or the, uh, of the image change had the artist made different choices? Who are all the possible people that might have made choices that impacted this images? We might have, without hearing from the Seattle Times, come to the realization that the image was indeed a manipulated image that was pulling different sources of photographs into one composite. And you can see that here. So here on the left is an image that was taken by a photographer named David Ryder. That was the original image. And the image on the right is another image taken by David Ryder. And Fox News decided without telling people um, that they were going to bring those two images together linking um, a space that was 
largely uh, peaceful, the Capitol Hill area of Seattle, and adding um, this really violent imagery to it. Um, um, you can see that this is a, like a similar location um, from a slightly different angle, but at two different times, one at night and one of day. So um, that kind of composite, a collage of images is, um, is such an important challenge, I think, that we all have as educators to help our students to be able to pick out what is real, what is manipulated, and how can we really tell. Um, looking at this right now, I'll just quickly say, like looking at the lighting of this figure um, lit up by fluorescent lights in the evening is a much different kind of lighting that you see here in the background. So that might be a clue to tell us that this was a manipulated image. So I know we're running out of time. Um, so I just wanted to share that with all of us and take the time to really use those questions so that we can apply them to thinking about visual images, both works of art and media. And I hope that as we went through this process of looking at an artwork made in 1984 first, um, it could help us sort of give a little bit of that distance so that we can really unpack um, what was going on in the image without um, really attaching our own opinions about the current protests and uprising onto that, although of course it's going to impact what we say and what we notice. So um, with that, I know that it is time. I promised a break and we're going to have it. Um, let me move on to this. We've been sitting here for quite a long time now and I do encourage all of us to have a moment to get some water, stretch, um, take a, fresh, uh, a breath of fresh air and come back at 4.30. So we're uh, running about 10 minutes late. And what we're gonna do is just shave off the time from the very end of our final discussion so that Felix can have his entire 15 minutes. So let's go ahead and do that. We'll come back at 4.30 and enjoy your break. All right, so I'm just looking at looking out at everyone and also looking at the numbers and it looks like most of us are back. So what I'd like to do now is to just introduce Felix, who is our teaching artist who's going to lead us in a really, really fun um, art making demonstration for the um, next 50 minutes or so. Um, and then we'll come together quickly for the final Oh, I hesitate to give a number in case we end up having too much fun with the art making. So I'll say maybe five minutes or so for final discussion, and that will be the end of session one. So, oh, full screen mode. Okay. So Felix Quintana is a multidisciplinary artist, photographer, and um, educator based in Los Angeles who has a community-centered art practice. His artwork has been shown in museums and galleries from London to Los Angeles, but I think that his footprint as an educator is even more impressive. He's really been out in the community across LA since um, becoming a teaching artist in 2016. He has served as a teaching artist for Las Fotos Project, Self Help Graphics and Art, Artworks LA, Heart of Los Angeles, Slanguage Studio, <laughs> Plaza de la Raza, now the Hammer Museum, Felix, I hope I didn't leave any major organization out, but he's just out in the community all the time because he's just a wonderful, wonderful person. My favorite combination of an artist's brain with an educator's heart. One of the things that you can't really see in his bio, but you'll all learn in just a second, is just how kind and creative he is. Um, and so that's the, the CV part of his bio. I'll turn it over to Felix now. He'll start sharing his screen to lead us through um, the art making demonstration. Okay. Uh, oh, there you go. There, there we are. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Tara, for the incredible introduction. And yeah, so let's go ahead and get started. So good afternoon, teachers, artists, colleagues, and everyone who's interested in expanding their knowledge uh, of media through art. I want to say thank you to the Hammer team for having me. 
alongside Professor Jeff Shar, who, who are interested, and those of you who are interested in finding innovative ways uh, to move or sort of reevaluate re our relationship to media in the 21st century, not only for ourselves, but for our students. So yeah, so welcome to Teaching for Social Justice, Social Change Through Art, uh, Strategies for Enhancing Media Literacy in 2020. Again, my name is Felix Quintana, and I'm really honored to be here today. So we're going to go ahead and go through. So just a quick schedule for today. I just want to do a quick group check-in just to see how everybody's doing today. And then I'm going to do a workshop introduction, followed by going over the specific themes that we're going to be focusing on, vocabulary, and then a demonstration for, for the Google Snapseed app. And then we'll have a portion to, for everyone to sort of explore a little bit of the app. Sound good? Thumbs up? All right, great. So, all right. So we're thinking about this idea of redefining history through our own archive. So essentially, this workshop is for teachers who want to learn how to use accessible media. So in this case, we're looking at Google Snapseed to combine popular and news media images with uh, that may include images, photographs, text, video stills, and sort of juxtapose them with our own archives. So looking at our phone and the fact that our phones carry so much incredible information in our archives. So we're, we're interested in essentially putting those two things together and exploring that idea. But before we get started, I just want to get a quick, uh, quick sense of where everybody is at. So in this moment, I think it's important to, to sort of take a step back where we're asked to reflect. But I want to see if everyone can just quickly type up in the chat, uh, what is your hope for the future? So it could be one word uh, or a short sentence. Uh, what is your hope for the future? So we'll take a moment uh, just to kind of see that. And then we can revisit this uh, a little later. So I think it's important to take moments, you know, essentially to, to, to reevaluate uh, where we are, where we've been, and move forward. And that's a, a big part of this, this workshop. I'm going to read out what I'm seeing, Felix, aside okay. from lots of love from you. Um, I'm seeing folks say honesty, unity, abolition, progress, justice, survival, teaching humanity, democracy, peace of mind, freedom, equality, and recreation. I'm seeing abolition. The word regenerates come up. Um, thriving, equity, kindness, community, justice. I see one, no Trump. Perspective taking, democracy and equity, transformation, kindness, critical media literacy, humanity, social justice. I'm going to try to get to everything. I'm scrolling as fast as I can. <laughs> Education, um, being led by truth rather than fiction. Um, oh, here's a sentence I love. Transformation out of the ugliness of inhumanity and into the love that we truly are. A second chance for humanity, reparations, students and families flourishing, thriving instead of surviving inclusion, empowerment, respect, and compassion. Great. Thank you, Tara, for reading off that incredible list. So it seems like a lot of us are interested in a more a future that that is that is hopeful. That that I think especially as educators that we have to sort of have this vision for ourselves and then bring that into our students and and essentially not lose that hope or have a sense of belief for no matter this this moment, uh, as, as tough as it might be, for so many for so many reasons, that we maintain that sense of hope for our future, and that we will kind of move past this. So, thank you, thank you for everyone for sharing, for participating, and thank you again, Tara, for reading reading that off. So let's go ahead and continue. So as we know, uh, the movement for Black Lives is fostering a possibility for reconstructing social contracts, reimagining our relationship to public safety and demanding justice for marginalized communities. And I think that in general, art has such an incredible, it, it is such an incredible tool for us to be using in this moment, uh, but also rethinking ways that we can, we can use it in an, effective, in an effective way, essentially. So in what ways can art be utilized as a tool to process, uh, to access, analyze, 
compose, reflect, and take actions. So these are some of the things that that Jeff uh, Jeff uh, Shar was you know considering through this idea of uh, media liter literacy. So I, I feel like digital art can be a really useful vehicle for exploring the proximity or dissonance between media narratives and individual experiences. Okay, so uh, the theme that we're going to be focusing on for today is the idea of identity in place. So oftentimes when we think about art production, it is very much focused on technique, but I think we, we, it's, it's important for us to also take this moment to reevaluate and refocus our energy towards more of a theme. As we see that a lot of contemporary artists are working uh, within uh, thematic terms. So we, we sort of see that um, emerging. So I just want to quickly go over some definitions for our theme. So in this case, uh, we have identity. So what is identity? It is the way that we perceive and express ourselves, the factors and conditions uh, we are born with uh, and or change throughout our life our experiences that we alter or how we see ourselves or are perceived. So thinking about identity. And then place. So place, a uh, physical environment, a particular region or center of population or location, uh, where are you from and where you reside. And of course, thinking about place as a central facet to our identity. So these things go hand in hand. So identity in place, essentially there's so many other themes that we can go into as far as home, uh, as far as time, but in this case, we wanna really focus on these two themes moving forward. Okay, so now I wanna go into vocabulary, uh, thinking about these words, archive, uh, what, is, what does it mean to archive as an artist, as a student, to reconstruct, reconstruct meaning, to remix, and also to transform. So archive a place in which public or private records or historical materials are preserved, a repository or collection of information. To reconstruct, uh, to build or assemble something again, to recreate or imagine something from the past, especially by using information acquired through research. This idea of remixing, a variant of an original recording uh, as, as of a song or made by rearranging or adding to the original. A piece of media which has been altered or, or contorted from its original state by adding, removing, or changing that piece of media. To transform, to change a composition or structure, to change the outward form or appearance of, or to change the character or condition. Again, we're looking at these uh, terms of to vocabulary as tools, as, as sort of um, a starting point to, to, to move forward within this, this idea of redefining history through our own archive. So again, redefining history through our archive. So much of what we see is very much outside of our own experiences. So I think this is a really incredible opportunity for us to Think about history as something that's that just you know that's a, a conversation that is something that we can participate in and have a very strong connection with and often that history is portraying us in so many different ways that do not include our own identity uh, the places that we come from and the communities that that we that we love or that, that we reside in all right so this is our prompt for today redefining history through our archive so for this activity uh, that I'm proposing for you all as teachers that we're gonna explore together and also an opportunity for your students to, to come together and explore these ideas. So for this activity, we're looking at creating a series of three to four double exposure compositions using Google Snapseed. So, uh, so some of the steps here, the first step is uh, selecting images that include this idea of identity or place from your personal archive. So again, going back to the theme, and then searching for images from the media that are either dissonant, so far away, or proximate, close to, to your images, to your archives. For myself personally, I've been looking a lot at, of course, like the Los, the Los Angeles Times, and, and sort of seeing the kinds of stories and the ways that, that maybe I might be uh, represented or misrepresented. So, uh, take a moment to maybe think about that. Uh, what are the kinds of me what, what what are the kinds of things that you see in the in the media 
And that could be ranging from broadcast media to television, to social media and all, all, all kinds of things like that. So take a moment to think about that essentially. And then essentially what we're gonna do from, from there is to overlay these two images together to create a double exposure. So we're thinking about this idea of layering and it's gonna be a really, really fun and interesting experiment. So taking everything that we do as, a, as an experiment essentially. Again, our materials that we're gonna be using are mainly our phone, that that's kind of all we have. Uh, so thinking about accessibility and the fact that our students are almost always on their phone, you're probably you know, hearing this program through your phone. And then optional, you could have a computer um, and any scratch paper or markers in this exercise. So if there's anything that maybe you wanna pull from the media, or for example, if you're more of a poet or like to work with words, then you can possibly use these other materials for this exercise. Okay, so now we're thinking about uh, guiding questions. So the first guiding question for the exercise is, uh, is your identity and community respectfully reflected in popular media? Okay, so that's the first one. And for me, I think um, this is a consistent question. Um, uh, for me, it's like a central theme uh, in my work as well as an artist, uh, especially thinking about photography. So I think photography, if we break down the word, it allows us to paint with light or to sort of take, the, take from the light of people or, or use that light as the sort of energy that, that happens or this, this exchange. So to rearrange that uh, with pixels or with a film, whatever medium that you may be using, and to possibly remix that history and to add to maybe a history that doesn't include you or your students or our students in this way. So we're kind of uh, using this process to excavate um, layers of time and space. So guiding question number two is, uh, what are some examples of beauty or struggle within your community? So again, thinking about uh, the media and, and often uh, what is lacking. Uh, so this idea of beauty or this beautiful struggle or simply a struggle that is happening within our community. So uh, it's important to take that moment or take this moment to take a step back and to see how are we being uh, represented uh, or how is my community being represented and asking this question, having your students ask this question uh, through this process and the work. Okay, so now I want to show you some examples of previous student work that I think have really, uh, really shine uh, through using this process. So this is a student work um, that the student used, essentially a self-portrait. So what we know as a selfie in this way, as, as this language um, that, that we use. And also thinking about advertisements. So she has here uh, in the store, she found these uh, eyelashes, these eyelash and thinking about beauty or, or what does it mean to, to, to feel represented as far as uh, advertising. So combining those two things together and very instantly making a conversation, having this dialogue between yourself and what, you know, what does it mean to, to, to try to be beautiful you know, as, a, as, a, as a young woman or as anyone in this situation. So, uh, like I mentioned before, uh, some students are maybe taking more to poetry or, or word language. So this is an opportunity when someone uh, took some words or wrote down a poem and then combined that uh, with, with this sort of like uh, cityscape of, of San Francisco. So combining poetry and thinking about the place, uh, thinking about place. In this case, uh, this student was thinking about movement, so movement building, um, a lot of actions that have been happening, you know, for the movement of Black lives, and also thinking about this idea of place. So again, uh, another image from, from San Francisco, uh, thinking about Black Lives Matter, and thinking about this sort of layering that happens. So this is the beauty of this process, the double exposure process, that you have multiple perspectives that are sort of aligned and created in one. And same student, uh, another, another image from the same student. So in this case, we have this idea of solidarity that emerges. So thinking about movement, action, uh, protests, 
uh, but also solidarity. So we see Asian Americans uh, in solidarity for, for Black Lives Matter. And we see the people on the street and, and that instant sort of dialogue to say that this is, this is something that we feel strongly about in this process. Another, another image here. So in a, in a way, thinking about a uh, home within this kind of uh, realm of identity and place. So our, our homes in this case are, are part of our homes, our, our laptops, our, our computers, our mobile devices. So the student just essentially working from that um, from, as a material. So thinking about technology and also that relationship to nature. So in a way, is it, is it woven together? Um, and how are these things relating to us uh, on a daily basis? And then again, going back to identity and place. So uh, this is a self-portrait uh, by the student here. And again, thinking about home, uh, where he's from, and, and layering those two things and in a way creating this kind of effect uh, through the, the double exposure that you're able to yeah, kind of see them um, in close proximity to, to each other. So, so now uh, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna do a, a demonstration uh, going through the app. So sort of navigating the app. So if there's any questions so far about some of the materials, uh, maybe we can take an opportunity now to, or if we wanna revisit anything. But yes, essentially we'll be ready to, to do the demonstration. Uh, any questions so far? I'll say out loud for anyone who is maybe joining us from their phone and not able to see the chat. We've had a, a couple of folks um, just share some trouble they're having downloading the app and um, some folks who've been asking for alternatives. And I'll just share that if you don't have access to the app or maybe you're working with students who wouldn't have smartphones of their own, um, an alternative to using the app would be what Teresa has said in the chat, just good old fashioned paper and glue through collage. So if, if, that's, if the technology isn't an option for you, um, you can use collage techniques, you can use transparency paper um, and things of that nature. Yes, exactly, yeah. So for some of the prompts, a lot of students have gone to more of an analog way uh, to do these things. And as far as getting that instant layering that, that happens, um, there's other ways to print uh, on translucent material, you know, if we have access to printers as well. Um, but yeah, this is just a quick way to, to sort of think about, um, yeah, different ways to use the media. But yeah, as far as uh, the prompts, so thinking about identity and, and place, yeah, there's so many other ways to, to engage directly with, with the media. And I, I think someone mentioned about a video as well. Uh, I, I recently uh, discovered uh, Adobe Rush, uh, which is, as long as you have an Adobe account, so you can actually, um, you don't, you, I think all you need is like, you don't have to have a paid subscription, but you can just make um, just an account and then you can use that for free to, to edit video as well. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead then uh, to go into this demo. So I'm gonna stop share here and then I'm gonna go transfer over to my phone and we can go through uh, the app just to kind of navigate a few possibilities. Okay. All right, so here we go. So I'm gonna go ahead and transfer back uh, to the Snapseed app. So uh, as soon as you open it, or you're gonna go ahead and it's very simple uh, layout. So we're gonna go ahead and just tap in the center here uh, to pull up our images. And in this case, I've already prepared a few images for, for the demonstration, but you can also work with the camera. So you can make uh, images on the spot or you can work from your archive. So we're gonna go ahead and open from Drive. And then I would suggest, in this case, uh, making a specific folder for, for your images. So I'm gonna go ahead and come in in this folder. So I have a few images from my own archives and also images that I've pulled from the media. So we're thinking a lot about essentially community, identity, um, place. 
So I have this image here of my grandmother. I'm gonna pull this one. And there's a few uh, pretty awesome tools that you can run through the app. So in this case, a few tools that you can do are, um, you know, very, very simple things like cropping. Um, you can actually do a little bit of, ed you know, further editing, such as like deleting uh, certain parts of the image. Um, but we're just gonna keep it simple, uh, make this image here uh, black and white. Uh, you can adjust a little bit of the contrast. So uh, very cool uh, to be able to navigate uh, the app, so it's very easy. So if you wanna make the image black and white, um, uh, we're gonna go here to the bottom where it says tools. Uh, we're gonna go all the way to the, to the bottom left where it says double exposure. So we're gonna click on that. And then uh, now that we have our base image, we can select another image. So in this case, I'm thinking about this idea of uh, my grandmother, uh, she's working on her artwork right here. And I'm pulling another image in this case from, I've been, I've been looking a lot at the, uh, a lot of the demonstrations happening in Portland. Uh, so this is an image pull, pulled from that. So as you can see, uh, the image just goes right over. So it's uh, very much layered, uh, this composition. And in the bottom, uh, the middle, uh, we have this, uh, there's like a, the X and then there's the add image in the middle. There's like this, um, the middle icon, you can go ahead and explore uh, different types of layering. And then you can also adjust it. So the idea here is to get it to the point uh, where you feel like the image is balanced. Um, there's so many, yeah, so many techniques that you can do uh, here. Uh, but in this case, uh, I like especially the lighten tool. So you can see we can explore a little bit of the opacity. So we have the full image here of these, um, the police officers here. So we want to get it to a point uh, where we feel like it's working. Uh, maybe we can explore uh, another, another effect here. So the idea is to, to, to think about um, this, uh, both images and how they, how they relate to one another. So essentially, the, you know, there, there's a big dissonance that's happening uh, with, you know, with these uh, two, with these two images. So, so we're going to get it to the point, and it's going to take a little bit of time uh, just to explore and see the kind of images that might work together. Um, so, so once we're done with the image here, on the bottom right, we're going to hit the export button, and you can go ahead and I would say save a copy. Um, so you can go ahead and save a copy of your double exposure, and then you're good to go. So maybe let's run through another um, the email there. So we can go ahead and go back to the top left button, open, and then we're gonna go ahead and select another image uh, from the device. So let's see what else we could do. Um, so in this case, for example, if we wanna bring in uh, other kinds of images such as a, co a collage in this case. So this is a collage that I created, including an image of a an old photograph that was actually shot in, in El Salvador uh, of some of my family members. So you can work with other media as well, you know, not only photographs, but if you want to work with collages or if you want to work directly with, you know, maybe a painting or a drawing or, or like poetry, you can do that as well. So we're going to go down and then we can check out the double exposure. And then, so next to the X, we have this uh, plus sign right here. So that's where you add your other image. So we're gonna go back to the double exposure icon. And let's see, I've also been really interested in, in sort of older, older history as well. So when we think about media, we can think about current media, uh, you know, a lot of uh, action demonstration, uh, but we can also revisit older media. So I've been looking a lot about uh, the 1965 uh, Watts Rebellion. So, so now we have it there and we can work directly with it. Uh, we can explore different options and see what kind of works best. So getting to the point where uh, both images sort of align. So I think that's, that's a pretty good point right there. So we hit that check mark and then it's ready to go. Uh, one thing you can do actually as well is you can layer more than one image. So you can go down and hit the double exposure tool again, 
and you can actually add like an, a third image or a fourth image. Um, it might get like a lot, <laughs> you know, it, it might get really intense, but what I've done too is uh, thinking about like visual elements. So it can be like a very representational image, uh, but in this case, we have like this light um, that I kind of took. So you could think about that uh, compositionally, how you can add uh, to that image, uh, just with other forms of, you know, other visual forms, uh, other elements of design. So you see how that adds uh, to it, gives it like another dimension and layer. Yeah, so let's see, then you can uh, mess with the opacity there. Um, so it's a lot of uh, ex exploring uh, with, with the app and essentially finding two images that have the similar, that are similar or that are dissonant, um, but also thinking about them visually as well. So, but all of that, you know, I think essentially uh, we'll catch up to it as far as the technique, uh, but most importantly, what we're thinking about uh, this idea of our identity, we're thinking about place. Oh, I'm getting another email from Molly. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna export this one as well. Save a copy. All right, um, we're gonna go ahead and try one more. So let's see what else we can do. Oh, so yeah, you can work directly with your camera there. So we're gonna go ahead, open, uh, select from device. And I've got my folder here. Uh, let's see, so I have this portrait uh, of a friend and yeah, just thinking about, um, you know, brown bodies in this case. So the representation of this young, you know, brown man and that idea of like that chin up. So a lot of times, um, yeah, taking an extra step to really think about, you know, that, that base image. Of course, we can kind of work with anything. Uh, we can try one that's black and white, uh, which is another possibility. So we can make uh, an image, one image black and white, and then we can have another one that is in color. So that'll give it like a different, a different feeling to the image and it'll make whatever. So for example, so yeah, in this case, we have this uh, live view of CNN that happens. So in this case, it becomes very abstracted, uh, that image that we have of, of like early in the pandemic of, of people demonstrating on the street. Uh, but you're able to possibly create moments that are more abstract as well, that becomes more of like a, a feeling and, and not so much of a concrete uh, message. So you find other ways to, to explore. So there you go, that, that's pretty, pretty surprised. I wasn't expecting that one. And yeah, I think as soon as you have like a catalog and there's so many possibilities to explore uh, there. So final step, we're gonna go ahead and, uh, and export it, save a copy. And essentially that's it. So hopefully uh, you see that there's a, new, there's a new tool for you all to use as educators that again, I mean, we, we do have that question of accessibility. Not everybody has a phone, uh, but in most households, you know, rethinking our, our relationship to the phone and saying that we could create art on the go, you know, instead of kind of scrolling mindlessly through social media, or we can pull from those images and we can create something that is uh, effective and it brings to question where we are and uh, where we're trying to go in, in general, uh, personally, or you know, as a society as a whole. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, stop my share here and open it up uh, to, to any questions. And, and I think we might have a, a little bit of time. So if there's any questions or if anybody wants to explore uh, some of these tools right now, then you can feel free. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Felix. Um, we've got, I've gotten a couple of questions in the chat. Um, the first, it, oh dear, I've lost my place. Oh, okay, here we go, sorry. The first question is from Norma, and this will speak to the artist heart of you, wondering how to help students navigate copyright issues with this process. So as they're going online and pulling different images and putting them all together for a presentation of some sort, how should we help them navigate making sure that we're crediting our sources and where the photos are coming from if we're not taking them ourselves yeah thank you that's a really great question i i think it, it is important to kind of how you mentioned earlier uh teresa was talking about uh, where is the source of this image 
So bringing that into the conversation is going to be really important. Um, thinking about the, you know, there is a photographer, you know, who took a lot of these images. Um, I mean, there's different ways to explore it. I think as a student, you know, uh, as long as the image isn't being sold or used uh, for profit, and if there's other ways to think about it more like as an educational tool, then I, I mean, personally, I, I think it's, um, I think it's valid uh, to, to explore that. But, but otherwise, you know, as far as when we talk about the work, um, you know, giving credit uh, where it's due, especially if it's, you know, any kind of image, but, uh, you know, whether it's historical, uh, current image, I think, yeah, I mean, maybe we can open it up to see uh, what you all think. Yeah, so Jeff says, uh, fair use allows you to use any image as long as you transform it. Yes, exactly. So that's why we're thinking about this idea of transformation. So if the image is, for example, if you have one image and you're just cropping into it, and you're kind of claiming it as your own, then that probably wouldn't be right, or it wouldn't be uh, considered fair use. Uh, but if you're transforming the image, so uh, a good example would be uh, like the Obama poster that was created by Shepard Ferry. You know, he sort of took this image from a photographer and created it into a poster. Um, and it's interesting now because yeah, there was a whole uh, conversation and a whole case, you know, that that that, that emerged from that. But, but now I see that there's, I see Shepard Ferry actually collaborating with photographers. So instead of taking with the, you know, taking the image and kind of using it, um, there's opportunities to maybe collaborate as well. So for example, yeah, if we know any individuals who might be willing to collaborate. So uh, thinking, you know, specifically about media, uh, but also our own archives. So for example, I know a, a William, William Camargo is in here, is an incredible photographer. You know, there's an opportunity for us to collaborate uh, where we can kind of share and mix, uh, you know, transform each other's images. So I think, yeah, there's, there's a really big range uh, in ways and the kind of discussions that can emerge from there. But, but yes. <laughs> Thank you. There's another question here from Louisa, which is, how do you suggest students best share their images via an online platform so that they can share each other's work? Do you have any recommendations for platforms that would be best for this? Yeah, I think uh, in general, I think it's really successful now within the classroom uh, to be using uh, certain apps like uh, Discord or even uh, Slack. I know Slack is probably, um, I mean, Discord for one, I mean, a, a, lot of, a lot of youth are on that right now. And I think it's a great way to, to possibly like open up the conversation um, and to kind of share images as far as you can simply upload something from your phone and drop it into like a, a discussion. But I think what I love about that possibility is that it's an ongoing discussion that we can share or works in progress. Uh, otherwise, I think using a website as well uh, could be a good tool. I know Wix, uh, with Wix, you can have like a forum, uh, a, a website added to your website. So I've used that in the past, um, using like a forum uh, where you can kind of create a uh, bigger discussion topics and students can uh, post their work uh, depending on the activity and of course uh, Instagram um, you know creating like a specific page but sometimes uh, that can be tough because the work is is public you know it's very public in that way um, so I think it's great to have uh, places where it can be possibly more private uh, such as discord or if it's a forum situation through through a website then you can kind of have works in progress uh, that can be shown that that it's not you know ready and ready to go uh, off into the public and live its best life, right? As far as like an artwork or any piece that's being created. But, but yeah, I think uh, an ongoing dialogue in this case would be really important. Um, yeah, Google Drive, uh, creating Google Drive folder as well. Um, but uh, yeah, in this case, we wanna think about like engagement. Uh, so again, uh, something like Discord is like constant engagement uh, that's happening because you can post an image people can uh, talk about it and it's kind of ongoing and it's also like a place where students can hang out as well so it's not like um like instagram usually we post and then we kind of like sign out or you know we try not to you don't really hang out as far as like you know a chat room essentially where you can uh, share images and hang out talk about them so i think there's some great uh, possibility there great um, I have one, one important point to sort of tag on to the question about copyright, which is from Molly, 
which uh, she says that this raises interesting questions about the ethics of using images beyond copyright, but also how to use something historical. So as we're pulling from images, we want to be very mindful of what we're pulling from um, different peoples and making sure that we're being very thoughtful and respectful as we're, as we're doing that. So that was an important point that I wanted to share for those who don't have access to the chat. But I have another question here from Kaya, which I think is for you, Felix, but could be, I think, maybe spoken to by all of the teachers in the room, which is, have you encountered a lack of proactive participation in the process of virtual learning, particularly in the discussion part? Yeah, I think, um, I think that there's a lot of uh, like, uh, layers that we have to... Oh, can you hear me? I think I might have uh, broken up a little bit there, but yeah, I think there's a lot of complex layers as far as a virtual learning that we have to kind of pull back from and like in a way like relearn. But as far as engagement, I think, you know, thinking about the, the live session as an opportunity that, that there, there's opportunity for live discussion. Um, so really thinking about the, the different ways, uh, mainly through the chat, essentially, I think is the best way that we can communicate or we can all kind of have a dialogue uh, that is ongoing. And, and of course, uh, we can uh, video share and do those things, but that, be, that can become a, you know, a little bit problematic sometimes um, as far as pe people's comfort levels and, and things like that. But otherwise, uh, again, kind of uh, shooting for um, a Discord again, uh, or like it's kind of chat rooms or Slack or whatever it may be, uh, a way that you can have the, the dialogue be ongoing. Um, which you know raises maybe some issues as far as um, is that really the platform that teachers want to be using? Uh, but I, again, thinking about accessibility and kind of meeting uh, the students uh, where they where they are, like where they hang out, and have the conversation be ongoing. So, so yeah, I think a, a really great resource that I recently found um, is a website um, called Art Prof, uh, Art A R T P R O F uh, dot com. It's an incredible educator. Uh, who was uh, an adjunct at uh, RISD on the East Coast and has really like innovated the way that that we think about our uh, virtual learning. So I've been looking at a lot of these uh, videos lately and becoming like really inspired by different ways that that we can engage our students. But but yeah, I think I think it's gonna be um, it's gonna be a challenge. But but you know there's so many incredible possibilities uh, that we have for for engagement. So yeah. Uh, I think checking out our prof would be a really great resource for all of you if you get a chance. I believe Tara got uh, lost internet connection. And so I'm just going to jump in until she's back. And here she is. Um, so perfect timing. I am back. But if we got any questions during that brief internet freak out, I've lost the chat. So um, now is a great time to, if you, if you want to ask a question, we can verbally do that so we can go back to raising hands and I can keep an, an eye out for hands that are raised or you can start adding to the chat and I'll dive right back in looking for those questions as they come in. As we wait, I did see a question earlier about whether or not Snapseed can be combined with Word Cloud. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, I haven't used a uh, word cloud, but that there um, possibly. <laughs> I'm not 100% sure though. We got one question, Felix, for you, which is, how did you get your phone to project so clearly? I think that there's a a new teaching strategy in here maybe if you can yeah so actually um, again I think it's really important as far as like demonstrations uh, for for teachers uh, to model the demonstrations doing it live so this is like as close as we can get to uh, our regular demonstrations when we were in the classroom so thanks to the incredible uh, hammer team uh, we were able to, to find a way uh, simply uh, through a screen share uh, so uh, using screen share on your phone uh, so I was actually connected uh, to my phone <laughs> in this process and and I was able just to kind of share um, and I guess thanks to my internet connection as well but, but yeah that's a great way to kind of uh, go through if there's any examples uh, on your phone uh, but yeah it was simply a, a screen share um, 
people looking directly at my phone. So the same way that you would, uh, well, I think it's called content share on your phone, but same way that you would share content uh, like a slideshow or anything on your computer, you could do the same uh, from your phone. Uh, but just being mindful, yeah, connecting to two different devices. And um, yeah, but I think that was really important as far as uh, doing something that, that is live, uh, a live demo, as opposed, I know a lot of teachers are really, um, you know, challenged to create uh, like video demonstrations, you know, whether it's you painting and having to record that. Um, but I think it becomes like a lot of work in that case to, to direct the video, lighting, <laughs> you know, uh, all those things. So maybe there's other ways. Um, you know, to have that set up and that, that website art, art prof uh, really goes into that uh, for that, that that possibility of like live engagement uh, like we're having right now uh, there's something really important uh, to that any final questions for felix final thoughts Okay, I have one that comes in from May, who's asking, what are some discussions that can be fruitful for students to encourage discussions similar to today's discussion topics? So what are some things that we're thinking about bringing into the classroom space when we're all back virtually together um, for the fall? Yeah, I think, um, again, kind of like really, like so much is uh, sort of going on and there's such a big, um, kind of window for exploration uh, that I think if we can work specifically with uh, specific themes in this case, uh, whether it's identity, uh, whether it's place, uh, looking at artists, uh, at artworks uh, that, have, uh, that have already explored these themes, uh, sort of as a point of inspiration uh, would be really important. Um, and I, I think, yeah, and you know, having those questions in a way be, be guided by, by the students and, and I guess uh, meeting your students. So, uh, where they are because i think there, there's so many questions that circulate their mind and for me i think uh, the way that i see it, it it's important to, to to kind of to take a moment to say uh where do we want to move from this um as a teacher um you know we have so much to share and to bring to the table but i think vice versa with our students so really seeing you know how, how can we use these tools because you know photography uh digital art snapseed it's just a tool in this way and you can use it uh, in any way that you, that you can, but I think once it's more focused uh, through specific topics, um, then, then then we can figure out uh, what, what are the questions that are like circulating our students' minds and maybe going from there. Um, yeah. I don't know if anyone else wants to add, Jeff. Yeah, please. Cool. Thank you, Felix. I, I just wanted to say what an awesome activity I think this is. Because what you're doing is you're allowing students to look at all sorts of different media and then to do something with it, to recontextualize it and repurpose it. I mean, that's a powerful um, opportunity for really critical thinking and for creating their own um, media, their own message. So I really appreciate it. Thank you. I think with that, um, thank you so much for, for sharing that, Jeff. Um, I think for now, I think we should turn it over to Kevin to wrap it up for our time together today. We have about 12 minutes to sort of thread through the various experiences we've had um, throughout this program. Thank you so much. Thanks, Teresa. Um, wow, really amazing evening. Um, so wrapping it up in 12 minutes will be a mighty task, but I've been thinking about a few things that um, will bring it back to sort of the VAPA perspective, which is to think about the, um, you know, the, the amount of expertise, not only from our four uh, teachers who I wanna publicly congratulate, you can all whoop whoop them in the chat, but thank you, Jeff, Teresa, Tara, and Felix for really great presentations that were um, amazing to us. But I'd like to also honor you as, um, really skillful pedagogues, um, and uh, which is to say, while they were very authentic in their presentations, I, I actually 
um, felt like you were also maybe instinctually or subconsciously modeling some really interesting strategies for teaching um, with a lot of tools and a lot of uh, kind of different um, methods that maybe could be helpful if we just name them, which is something we do in our teacher uh, teaching artist training program as well. Of course, this whole seven pages of teachers are filled with experts, so maybe you caught a lot of them, but I wondered if maybe um, uh, and I can I have access to some of the hands um, if you want to raise your hand or even put it in the, the chat. But is there anyone um, who want, wants to call out some of the strategies that Jeff, Felix, uh, Teresa and Tara used and um, maybe think about how they are in your uh, toolkit or maybe how you might want to um, include them or practice them in your toolkit. You know, the art of pedagogy is both the theory and the practice of teaching. So. Is there anyone who wants to get meta on us? And what just happened? <laughs> I promise there's no wrong answers because a lot happened. <laughs> okay, Matt, I see your hand up. No, maybe that's from before Nat. I don't know. Okay. So I see that there was use of video and um, uh, Kamiko, this is maybe a great time to introduce you. Kamiko, who will be our teaching artist on Wednesday evening's session, um, uh, talked about use of video. But Kamiko, is there any, a few other things that you notice that are like sort of tools that a teacher has that maybe we can uh, think about? You can unmute yourself, Kamiko, if you're there. There we go. Sorry. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm so excited to be part of this, um, uh, these workshops and everything. And I, I mean, I saw video. Um, there was PowerPoint presentations. Um, just the kindness of your faces, too, was wonderful to see um, online. Um, the use of moving parts in Jeff's. Um, screen as he was talking on his PowerPoint presentation um, was a way to keep me um, attached to the information that I was receiving. Um, so that's just a few of the things that I noticed. Thank you, Kamiko, and we look forward to your theater arts presentation on Wednesday. Um, so here are a few things I'm reading in the chat. So Teresa used paraphrasing is Teresa, that was a very skillful both really leading us in a deep thinking, slowing down to think about one photograph, one image for quite a long time, which sometimes I don't know uh, if we take that time when we're in a gallery or we're in a museum very often to take that much time to look at one image. But honestly, we were there for a really long time and we kept digging and digging and you skillfully led us in that. Would you mind sharing some of the, I mean, would you kind of maybe describe or name some of that method that you were utilizing for us? Thanks, Kevin. Well, yes, paraphrasing was certainly an aspect of this. Um, a nod to visual thinking strategies many of you use, I, I'm sure, if you talk about works of art. Um, we, at the Hammer, um, encourage anybody to share their perspectives about works of art. And then we try to make connections between what we see and some information. Um, I also use the pointer quite a lot just to help draw our eye to certain moments and certain parts of the image that I think is helpful so that we're all on the same page. Um, I think another thing that I, that I did was wait until a little bit later so that we could all gain uh, our own understanding of the image before sharing information, before sharing the title even, and then tying a lot of the media literacy questions into the process itself so that we can think about what title we give to the work before we see the title helps us to be a little bit more critical about our own subjectivity in this process. So there's a few things. Thank you. Um, as we look towards, again, another six months or if not more of teaching and meeting our students online, um, our personality, so I, our, our demeanor, our engagement with our students and vice versa really matters. So I appreciate Kamiko's 
comment about their kind, warm faces. And also, um, I have a, a, a comment here in the chats for you, Felix. There's so much good feedback for you, but just your sense of humor and your generosity and warmth really translates through the screen. And so I would um, like to salute you for that. I think we all felt it. Um, I, I, I guess there was a sense of humor when your phone rang. Someone appreciated that. Um, Using and I just wanted to draw your attention to Jade and Edwina, both had hands raised. In case you oh, great. I don't see that. Edwina, thank you. Go ahead, Edwina. You can unmute yourself. I actually answered in the chat, and I said that um, think along and demonstration and um, what else did I say? I answered back in the chat, so it was... I've already expressed it through the chat. All right, thank you so much, Edwina. The strategy um, here. Is. By the way, this chat is on fire. Tara, I hope we're saving this and there's some way to share this with folks. Um, and uh, was there another comment, um, Teresa, that you noticed? Hand I raised? think there was a hand raised from Jade too. Hi, Jade. Hey, yeah, so I was, I was just thinking that I'm really gonna love using um, Jeff shared those sort of key questions, that framework with us. Um, and then Teresa also had those questions as well. I think that making sure that questions are guided yet really open-ended help encourage student discussion um, because they're not looking for a right or wrong answer, right? Um, and I think a lot of students, I, I teach high school, so I think a lot of students get bogged down um, thinking that they, they might be embarrassed, that they might say the wrong answer. So I'm excited to use those. Uh, great. Any other teacher observations that would be helpful for synthesizing our experience? I appreciate Pablo's comment of differentiation, showing text, then verbalizing that text, then visual examples of that text. So really vocabulary building that feels very organic to like the conversation and the uh, um, discussion. And I think so many of you did that. Um, Felix, this is a comment from Raina. Felix used a lot of schema, which I'm not familiar with that term. So I really appreciate also learning. I mean, I heard the word probably, but clearly modeling and telling us what he was thinking as he was doing it. So really you stayed in your moment, which kept us in your moment and uh, that, that led us to like kind of stick with you, which I think is a great um, example of, uh, you know, connection and engagement. Um, um, there's one more thing. I, I only have one more maybe moment to, to share, but I wanted to go back to one earlier concept we, we talked about and we might um, unpack that a little bit more, but um, it was the idea of some social emotional benefits of just our experience tonight with each other. I mean, when we're talking about, um, you know, coming back together in the fall with our students, we're also bringing our true selves back. And we have been through a lot. I mean, we, the teachers, have been through a lot. And so the way that we can, um, I guess, honor our own experience appropriately at the same time we're using that to honor our students, I think is really helpful. Um, and so using the arts is a way for us to connect to um, our own memory, our own um, emotional, uh, state of being and also maybe going back to what Felix started with as well which is connecting again to like what do we hope for um, what are what are what are our goals or do we still have a like a, an ounce of optimism in us and if it is maybe you know naming it and being able to like identify it and, and focus on that and so by doing that I think we're raising a kind of um, self-awareness that's important for us as we look down a, a brand new school year that's gonna feel very different. Um, but that self-awareness can lead to um, social awareness and awareness of the whole room and giving a space for everyone to connect um, to, connect to each other. Um, and I think again, um, the benefits of social emotional learning are complicated by being virtual and being online. I know I can speak personally that last year I had the benefit of spending eight months with my students before I had to go virtual, right? And now we're looking to meet new students in a, in a very different way. But hopefully um, we can kind of hold on to some of those, you know, principles of our teaching and the way that classrooms can create community albeit differently. Um, were there anyone else who had an observation about any kind of social, emotional kind of uh,
benefits that we experienced, you know, authentically tonight, um, self-discipline, self-management, um, any kind of decision making we were able to do, and then relationship skills that we're able to build because we were together tonight. Does anyone want to reflect on that? I did notice that Edwina had her hand raised again. Um, it's been ha raised for a while, so I think it's in relation to something that has come up. Is that right, Edwina? Right. I, I was answering something you previously asked, another strategy, and it was I wanted to express that the uh, learning goals or the in intentional learning goals was very clear in the beginning, at the offset, the beginning uh, slides. Yeah. Thank you, Edwina. Everyone had objectives and agenda that they shared. Thank you. That's that. Yeah, that's that's very true. Right. So, we have about one minute left. So, Kevin, you can take us home, please. Right. Well, hold on to any observation you might have had about some of your social emotional um, experiences. But basically what I'm reading in the chat a little bit is an appreciation for everyone's willingness to share. And hopefully we can build on that on the second evening. So a little bit of housekeeping. If you haven't yet signed up for the second evening, I know that link is, a, is available and there's still some capacity and space for that. Um, and also the third, I see there's a question about the third evening. And I think the reservation link is not yet up for that, Tara. That's correct, right? It's not quite up yet. Yes, that's right. So the RSVP link for day three, which will be next Monday, isn't ready yet, um, but it will be later on this week. And so when it is, we'll be sure to post that up on our website and also email all of you so that you have access to it um, when that's ready. Yeah, but definitely um, Wednesday nights, same, you know, same time, same place, sort of. Um, we're going to continue the conversation. Um, uh, but extended it in, in, in certain ways. I think Kamiko, who we just had the, the good fortune to meet, is going to be the teaching artist leading us through a theater arts workshop. Um, you need nothing but your, your body, your mind, your face. Uh, so you don't, have, you don't need any materials. And we're really lucky to have a guest speaker to kick us off the way Jeff did this evening. Um, Professor Douglas Kearney from the University of Minnesota is gonna come in. He's a librettist, poet, a performer, uh, but also a visual artist, really a multidisciplinary kind of uh, thinker and practitioner to really talk to us. In some ways, it was uh, helpful, Felix, I, you won't know how beneficial it is, but we're really going to think about juxtaposition, layering, and collage um, on Wednesday as well. So it really extends beautifully. But we're going to do it in the, in the realm of theater arts, which might be a really interesting way for some teachers in the room to help their students um, layer and identify the complexity of their thoughts and feelings, but in a maybe a more of a performing arts sort of realm. Teresa, that's about it for me. Um, anything else I missed that would be helpful for folks to know before we say goodnight? No, I think that's it. I just want to thank everyone so much for your attention and your time and your participation. And we look forward to convening again in a Zoom room on Wednesday, if you can join us. And if not Wednesday, then next Monday. Um, so have a wonderful day. And if I think so, a few of our staff members can hang on for a little bit if you have any questions that we didn't get uh, to get to, um, and you can respond in the chat. Otherwise, have a wonderful day. Thank you.